Hello and welcome to One on One. I am Cyril Stover. Now, current events in the country show a rising spate of discontent in the polity. Against the backdrop of daunting socioeconomic challenges, there is a renewed wave of calls for what is now the latest addition to the lexicon of Nigerians, restructuring. Now, understanding what exactly this means is no easy task. There are as many interpretations of restructuring as there are voices calling for it. Today on One on One, I have a public intellectual, a former senior research fellow, senior lecturer, Abia State University, Uturu, a founding national secretary, Alliance for Democracy. He's currently director of communication and strategy, patriotic movement of Nigeria. Let's welcome Dr. Udenta O. Udenta. Thanks for being here. So it's always a pleasure to be with you. All right. Patriotism. Perhaps that's a place to start from. Where are the patriots? The patriots in our midst are uh, very much around, and uh, possibly depends on how you define the territory or the site of patriotism. Mm. We hear more of ethnic patriots than mm. national patriots today. If you talk about uh, the Ariwa Consultative Forum, the organized in Debo, the Femi Ferry, the Middle Bay Forum, and the Niger Delta. There are many champions that will step out and say, we are speaking for our people. We are protecting their interests. We are fighting against marginalization. These are ethnic patriots. But when you speak about patriotism at the center, an inclusive patriotism that harnesses the strengths of these diverse groups and entities to create a national whole, possibly most of those patriots are not very visible. That is the essence of the patriotic movement of Nigeria, to alert our the nation mm -hmm. and our people to the need that they can leverage on the strengths of the various ethnic nationalities, professional groups, class alliances, interfaith structures and collectives to build a greater Nigeria in spite of the daunting challenges which you pointed out in your introduction. All right. So why, why, why is there a short supply of these patriots? It's, uh, you know, over a hundred years after the coming together of these uh, the two uh, protectorate. So why is it that the patriots, the national patriots, are still in short supply? The country in the past 50 something years has undergone complicated transformations since the dawning of post-colonization, since we became an independent nation. The first experiment in civil governance abruptly was terminated in 1966. Then a long period of military dictatorship and then a redemocratization process that commenced in 1999. There are deep challenges in the country. There are deep challenges in the governance model, deep challenges in the pattern of democratization, deep challenges in the so-called delivery of uh, social, economic, and cultural services to the people. So when we look at these overwhelming challenges, the idea is to retreat back from the frontiers of the nation into those territories of the ethnic you know, zones. But I believe that is not the way to go. The founding fathers and mothers of this country, the so-called our heroes past, and their levels and blood crafted together from the weight of this disparate and these different diverse, diverse nation, you know, nation groups to form Nigeria. And to form Nigeria with a mindset, with a vision, and an ideal to create a nation that is going to become a signpost of civilization for Africa and the black race. We have underwhelmed in various regards. But I believe that such underwhelming in the situations and circumstances are not enough for the patriots of today to drop the button our founding fathers gave to us. It's like a relay race. If the first person starts the charge down the line and the second person picks up the button, the torch shouldn't allow that button to, no matter the circumstances, you must always make sure that you carry on that button to the last person that anchors it. It is our generational responsibility and duty 
to anchor the visions of founding father. So it becomes an abomination. What I describe it as the umbilicus, which is in the naval of our dawning. If we severe it, then we uproot that ontology, that sense of being and identity as Nigerians. And sometimes people always have a, the mindset that Nigeria is a mere geographical expression. Every nation is a geographical expression. It is how you construct and de redefine that geography into a political union, into a constitutional union, into a democratic union that erases that essence of it being a mere geographic expression. All right. Some go as far back as the amalgamation and say that's a faulty foundation because uh, the coming together was for a specific selfish interest for the group of people who came to these parts uh, to advance their own cause. Absolutely. I understand that. And I've tried to explain it in two ways. The motivations of the British colonialists and imperialists, of course we know that we can't even really think, litigate those motivations now. Economic exploitation, political subjugation, cultural destruction of our philosophy, of our spiritual life and everything. That's understandable. But the idea of a nation is what redeems coloni colonialism. The idea that we are bringing these people together not merely to advance them, to exploit them, but at the same time we are bringing them together to understand one another, to know one another, and relate with one another. There was no time and a, a clarion call was sounded, and Zeke and Awolo and Tafawa Belawa and the rest all made a phone call. There were phones in those days to say, where the hell are you? We must come together and form a great country, fight for independence. No. From the different territories, they had this idea that we must liberate ourselves. And in liberating the East and the West and the North, you came to the center for the totality of that liberation. So in a sense, as an inheritance, it was not a very noble inheritance. But it's how you convert that inheritance, which wasn't noble, into a noble inheritance that helps the success story of Nigeria. Can you build on something that's on shifty sand? That you can build on it, because every nation is a shifting sand. Mohammed Haiko, one of the strongest public voices in the past in Egypt, described every nation as a consequence of geography and demography. Have you seen geography and expression? America was a British colony of 13 colonies. It is today 50 states. The last was Hawaii in the 50s. From the 18th century to 1950, the nation was still forming. There was brutal wars against Mexico. That led to the inclusion of Texas, New Mexico, California, Nevada, and so on. Then there was a purchase of land, Alaska, from Russia. So it can describe America as a mere geographic expression in that sense. And don't forget that Puerto Rico is still knocking on the door, waiting to be included as the 51st state. But it is building a constitution that every American is proud of, a constitution that restores citizenship to everybody. And in restoring citizenship, it dissolves ancestral and indigenous claims to citizenship, which means to be Nigeria means you are more than being Igbo, you're more than being Hausa, you want to be Yoruba or Idoma or Efik. But if we can't overcome the building of democratic citizenship or constitutional citizenship and allow ourselves to be defined in terms that is ethnic in consideration, then we're not making progress in building Nigeria. Now let's fast forward from the amalgamation to the point of independence. And uh, it would seem that there was one goal, a common goal, self-determination. Is it that we lack goals at this time? We do not lack goals at this time, but sometimes a nation comes to historical junction and then it meets crossroads. The crossroads of retreating to the past, the crossroads of dispersing, or the crossroads of strengthening the bonds of unity and solidarity. I believe that for us to overcome the crossroads of the moment, for us to overcome the debilitating failures of the post-colonial state, for us to look at its successes too, from the founding of the nation to where we are, we must dig deep into that founding ideal that defined the character and the life and the sacrifices of our fathers and mothers who set up this Nigerian entity in the post-colonial period. There are many things that can power our dream for today and tomorrow. The facts is a better constitutional framework that brings again the term restructuring, mm -hmm. a better constitutional framework that allows not only ethnic national nationalities but all the groups and entities that make up the Nigerian polity, a deep sense of purchase and a buy-in into the project. And secondly, strengthening civil society engagement with the state at the level of governance. 
that can generate this momentum in accountability, probity, you know, and transparency in terms of what people see government doing and then the consequences of the actions of government. All right. Every so often, uh, we include new words into the lexicon of this country. And then the latest now, as we said, is restructuring. But of course, people have asked, restructuring how, what, when, where, the very concept of restructuring, what exactly is it? Line up 10 people, there are 10 different definitions. Now you have, uh, you have captured the essence of this debate. You talked about the what, about the when, about the why, and about the how. The most crucial of all these categories in analysis is the how. What to restructure, however we define restructure, is almost taken as a given. The structural relationships are not balanced. The federation is not actually federal in nature. It's more unitary in conception. There's more power for the center, less power to the federating units or the states and local government. You need to rebalance this power distribution and projection. You need to devolve power again from the center. You need to make it less cumbersome to manage Nigeria here and then let the federating units drive transformation you know, processes. These are the things which we all know. Two, when do we achieve this? It's very crucial, but it's not too difficult. We can set a date and work towards a date, like you have a national conference and say, we give you two months to finish the work. At most, you can tinker it and give it in two extra weeks or three extra weeks. So the when to do it may not be too critical. The why to do it. It's not even too difficult to fathom out. Because as I say, the system is not functioning optimally. Then the how is where the trouble begins. That is where you find absence of rigor. That is very challenging. The lack of rigorous interrogation of the how, the process, the strategic processes, the framework to restructure. That is why the politics is very hot. Because it is good, it is easy to mount the platform, to mobilize people, to chant songs, to pontificate, to sloganeer, to phrase monger. But it is difficult for you to sit down and say, how then do I achieve what I want to achieve? In 1998, Abacha died and Abiola died. There was a constitutional vacuum. There was no democratic space. Civil society was far, far, far subjugated. Even the, even the judicial apparatus of state was not functioning optimally. That was a time to restructure the country it was a time to put together in the conference with constituent powers so that the military that came in, Abu Salami Abuka that came in after Abacha, we then have a document from the people with which to proclaim. That wasn't done. Politicians like myself, who was a founding secretary of Alliance for Democracy, never even saw the constitution of 1999. If I saw it, I'm not sure what I read. The idea was to get the military out of the system with whatever document they have so that in future, at the future date, we can now resolve the issues we postponed for the moment. Now we have a democratic system in place, a constitutional order. It can only restructure on terms and parameters set by this constitutional order. The constitution may not be a document we love so much. It has some fairly small good points, but most people can see that there are some debilitating challenges. But you still have to restructure the country on the terms set out by the constitution. To do otherwise is to dissolve the constitutional state. All right. So because you have some people argue and say, look, the constitution is no use here. And so there are others who even say, don't even amend the constitution. No, I don't. Rewrite. I, I write. Do look, you can rewrite a constitution only in one specific direction. That is the hard question. How do you rewrite the constitution? The law provides that only one entity, the National Assembly, has the legal authority the legitimate claim to rewrite the constitution or reconstruct it or retextualize it. To do otherwise is to surrender the power of the National Assembly and at the same time to dissolve the democratic political order. Because you must create a space, a vacuum, in order to do something unique or strange. If not, you must engage that system the way it is. That is why I worry with a lot of, you know, discordant tones in the system and a lot of, you know, analysis in the discourse space. It is possible to pressure the National Assembly to do the needful. Look at the so-called failure of the devolution of power bill. It shouldn't have been so. Now, talking about that, there are those who argue that the very concept of devolution of power is anti-federalism. And they have arguments for that. What kind of arguments would they pose? A federal system is a system that balances the power potentials, 
the resource availability and the power projection of the center and the federating units or the composite units, however you define them. In balancing this relationship, what you do is you ask yourself, what are those things best done at the center? And what are those things best done at the federating units? And don't forget that the history of Nigeria, the post-colonial history of Nigeria, has demonstrated whether we like it or not, the overabundance of power at the center. During the Babangida transition, the governors were already in place. The National Assembly was working. But the dispute over the presidential election nearly crashed the project. Under Abacha, the governors were waiting to take over. The senators were waiting in the wings. Look at chairmen and councillors were functioning. But the transmutation of the dictator into a presidential candidate was where the problem was. You know why? The center was overattractive. So this evolution of power simply means to make the center relatively unattractive. So we do not have to overstretch the system in fighting for power, for control at the center. Now, we've had this argument all the time to say the best thing is to take away that massive power from the center and take it down. But it's, it's an irony, isn't it, that when people do get to that center and wield that power, they're no longer in a hurry to talk about the evolution. But as soon as they're out of it, then the clamor begins and says, look, we need to bring this power back to the people. What it, do you say about it? Now, you see, in, in building a nation of laws and not a nation of men, you dispense with the pyrotechnical attitude of individuals in power. You deal with institutions. You deal with processes. I'll give you an example. Not too young to run succeeded not because the members of the parliament loved them. They forced the issue. They campaigned for it. They resisted all opposition to that. They wrote letters, they carried flyers, they went online, they had sit-ins and so on. In a measured, powerfully, mature manner, they phoned every legislator. They contacted them. They went to the constituencies. They mounted series of aggressive and proactive activities that yielded a result. That wasn't done for devolution of powers. So whether a president who was speaking about restructuring before comes to power and wants to shut down the space of the discourse because he's now going to enjoy enormous power. We have various national groups. Have you asked yourself if Ohadeze, the governor's forum in the southeast, even the state determination groups, civil society structures come together with each other? This is what we want the 15 legislators, the senators from the South, is to do for us at the National Assembly. We sent you there. Do not come back except you accomplish it. And it happens in the South-South, in the Southwest, in the Northwest, in the Northeast, in the North Central. It is the pressure from the people, from their groupings, cultural, sociocultural, and sociopolitical groupings, that we compare them in spite of themselves to adjust and amend and we do the Constitution in a way and manner that people will love. That is assuming that the people actually sent them there. The people sent them there because if you did not send them there, there's no way they could have gotten there. No matter how, the electoral process may have been a little bit, a little bit. Uh, our, our electoral processes have become increasingly far more free, fair, open, and transparent. And our judicial system at that level has been far more robust. Don't forget that even in the past one, two months, some senators have been sent packing. Some members of the House of Rabbis, body courts. So sometimes if you corrupt the electoral system and somebody who challenges you has the facts and goes to court, he, wins, he or she wins a case. But there's still largely a disconnect between those who occupy these offices supposedly on behalf of the people and the people It shouldn't themselves. be so. It is not their responsibility to behave the way the people want them. It is the people that will compare them to behave the way they want to behave. If I will send a counselor, to the local government office, and it's not he or she is not doing very well. You have your kindred groups, their clan groups, the Omunna, like in Ibo. You sit in them and say, This is not what you are, you're not doing what we sent you to do. Even if you bought your vote today, we know you are representing us, purportedly representing us. Do not come back home without pressing the chairman and his council, fellow councillors, and this you know, leadership structure about what we need a corporate, a school, a church, whatever it is. But if you're indolent, and you're dormant. I don't even want to express yourself in ethnic particulars. Because I believe that you form identity in multiple forms. When you believe that you have intergenerational tensions in the country, you have class tensions in the country, socioeconomic you know, disparities, 
apart from the very noted ethnic differences. These are the things that must combine to produce complex identity modes. But when you now try to singularize the identity, just Igbo, Hausa, Yoruba, and so on, it's for me anti-intellectual and primavia. But when you see yourself as a collective, the men, the women, the youth, the poor, the rich, coming together to say this is what we want our parliamentarians to do for us, it becomes easy to restructure the constitution on the terms and particulars the people want. If you do not pressure them, and they sit back completely at peace with themselves and comfortable in their own narrow world, and then you say the evolution of power bill has failed. It failed because it did not pressure them. All right, let's uh, take the much touted issue of marginalization. And uh, there are arguments that have been put forward where a group feels it is marginalized, and even within the marginalized groups, you find issues of marginalization. Sure, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a almost like a domino effect. Marginalization, just like a, the upsurge in ethnic self-love, a situation I characterize as being almost troubling incestors. Marginalization is a concept that has been used, misused, and abused. And as you know, I did not theorize marginalization. Mm. We lived it in struggle as a member of the Eastern Mandate Union. We are the first group Abacha gave ultimatum. And our name speaks for itself, Eastern Mandate Union. We believe that in the formation of the post-1970 Nigerian statecraft after the Civil War, that the structural you know, issues and institutional issues excluded the East far more than the rest of the country. And there's a need to rebalance the consideration in terms of this inclusiveness. So the process of demarginalizing Eastern Nigeria, not just the Wuhan land, must be mainstreamed as part of our national political discourse. And substantially, this matter you know, was mainstreamed, and it became increasingly for granted. Sometimes there were some issues of the way the military you know, government on the time managed, like Sarah Wewa, and they were going to eat, they were going to eat people, the way they lost their lives. But it raised the tempo of the struggle of the Niger Delta people to appreciate their contribution to the national economy. But I believe that marginalization will become a thing of the past if we construct a new constitutional state. If you have a constitutional text that respects let, let, almost all the diversities and peculiarities that make up the Nigerian okay. state. Let, let, let's use certain examples to, to, you know, to press on this point. While not mentioning specific names of states and ethnic groups, we can find ready examples where certain ethnic groups would say, look, we are not well represented at the center. We need to be there. These groups are basically in certain states okay, know, now the, 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 of the they, country. They, they, but you find within those same states, the people who shout the loudest about not having a hand in decisions at the center also deny the minorities within their own let locality me, let me, the opportunity of contributing let to... Me, let, me, let me put it this way. Yes. Between 1999 and 2007, various clusters of states or zones or regions have had a very fair taste of power. Mm. If not at the presidential level, something near enough. Either they controlling the commanding heart of the economy, being a security apparatus, and then being in high intensity, capital intensive capital, you know, capital intensive ministries, departments and agencies. In essence, as you said, without explicitly mentioning names, from ninety nine to the present time, clusters of states and regions and zones it's like a fan rotating. It has gone round, but everybody is still complaining about marginalization. Mm -hmm. So it is not the closeness to power that reduces the impact of marginalization. It is the way and manner you apply that closeness to power. It is building institutions and infrastructure. It is empowering people as a collective. It is providing for them the basic tools that they require to live a decent life in the 21st century environment, good roads, okay? Communication, power supply, health care delivery systems, education opportunities. Once these are provided for a people, it does not matter how at a specific historical era is the overabundance of people from the other side more than my own side. Because there was a time people from my own side were equally very dominant in power and still we lack those things. If you like them at different times with different clusters of people within power, 
It doesn't mean there's something fundamentally wrong with the way we deliver power and deliver services. And not just the presence of individuals, powerful ministers, and so on. In a sense, what the people must do is to hold their leaders accountable. That is where the power lies. In a state that has a constitution that is weak, not optimally functioning, in a state where leaders sometimes disconnect from the mass of the people, it is the responsibility of the people, led by civil society platforms, radical youth groups, social pressure organizations, national, nationality unions, to hold those in power at any point in time accountable. Because my suspicion is that if within a four, five, six year cycle, our people in hold, we are in power or dominant in different portals of power, and we had good roads and electricity and you know, pipe bomb water, good communication network, good public health services. And for the next three, four years, our people in quote are not even so much in power. The impact will be cushioned because we already have those tools and assets that could make our life very easy. But when altogether you find that the totality of the political environment defined by non-accountable governance, people who do not really owe anybody any obligation, and the people do not even care that these obligations are not owed them. Governance is a contract. It's a debt. You are owing something. When you get to power as a legislator, as a member of the executive branch, you are owing the people something. They must have a list of their charter of demand, their bill of rights. They must demand for those things. When they fail to demand for those things, even across the developed world, that's why we have changes of government. From the Republican to the Democratic you know, models in the US, from the Labour Party to the Conservative in Britain. If life is rosy, even for the advanced liberal democracies of the West, they will not change their government. But when the government fails to live up to expectation, the people will hold the government accountable. So I suspect that more campaign should be mounted now at the level of full public engagement, citizenship participation, at the levels of holding our leaders responsible for governance, unless at the level of deterritorizing the patriotic fervor in Nigeria and then creating sites and ethnic sanctuaries and domains, this upsurge in ethnic self-love that is not heralding the new Nigeria of our dream. Mm. That is the way I look at it. Okay. Closely related to the issue of uh, the ethnic divide, you find the introduction of religion as well. Why should that be a factor? Let me put it this way. Some people suspect or think we live in a post marxist world. Some say new Marxist one, derived from the philosophy of Karl Marx. He's who famously taught about religion being the opium of the people. In a much more less elegant way of putting it, religion has been classified sometimes as a mood of false consciousness. It is not that deep faith and belief is injurious to the health of a nation. But when you leverage on faith in order to score, political points, in order to exclude the other because of the self, the self being you and people who share the same faith with you. It is the same way of constructing identity in singular terms, this singularity of identity among some Europe, an imagined Arewa utopia or Biafran utopia or Nigeria utopia, an imagined Christian utopia or Islamic utopia. This utopias may turn out to be more dystopian than even the contemporary Nigerian space. Because the moment you hold at arm's length, the past others entrance into your life, into your realm, because of religion, you are just leveraging on false consciousness. You are capitalizing on people's weak social consciousness, people's weak education, political you know, awareness, to simply confuse them and deceive them. And they make enemies they shouldn't make. I always have a way of saying that the Talakawa or the Mamajiri in Kano the pure water seller in Onitsha Head Bridge, and the fellow you call a the urban youth drifting and excluded from society, in Lagos, who shout, Arewa, Biafra, and Odudua, have less in common, have more in common with themselves and less in common with the billionaires from these ethnic configurations. If it's the pictures that made internet the other day, a yacht and billionaires having fun, they were Yoruba, Hausa, Igbo, Ethic, Middle Bed, Nigeria, the billionaires together relaxing. It is the economic in 
interests that bind them together. But the masses are separated by religion and ethnicity. So the guys suffering in Kano, in Onitsha, in Lagos, are told that their enemies are somewhere else when the enemies are within. So when you transcend these limitations in terms of consciousness and social exposure, you begin to appreciate the solidarity of the oppressed, of the common people, and the unity of the people who are worthy. Because even in your imagined utopia, there's going to be rich and poor, upper and lower, those in misery, those in wealth. So these contradictions, like you pointed out, Cyril, is going to multiply in the domino effect. So the zero-sum game of my people against the other people is not, as I said, it's anti-intellectual and it's very primitive in contemporary Nigeria. That is a sense of the struggle of the patriotic movement of Nigeria to build a new national consciousness out of the collective identities we are proud of. I'm proud of you. And as I said, I did not theorize even the struggle in the 90s of Eastern Mande Union and Nadeko. Even in 2010, the noise of Adibo presidency was something which I located deep in my heart and helped to drive. So I love my people, but I love Nigeria. I'm a proud person from a very solid ethnic background with its history and its civilization. But I'm proud as a Nigerian because I know that my affiliations cut across my ethnic stock. And the class I belong to as a public intellectual are found within the ranks of Nigerians from the northeast and west. And the class of poor suffering workers are cut across the nation. The class of women struggling in a society defended by male dominance is cut course across. Youth with intergenerational inter inter challenges, the millennial generation, they have different mindsets, different ideas and vision from us. It cuts across the nation. So we must begin to build this composite nation state of core patriotism at the center and not dilute and dissolve our patriotisms and locate them at the ethnic frontiers and domains. It's been said that um one of the challenges when faced contemporary Nigeria is the issue of um, the leaders who have not led properly. The leaders have also said, look, the youth do not have the experience. They do not know what we went through in the struggles. And therefore, they're not in a position uh, to craft any form. I think, of, I think uh, history, history believes this kind of uh, mindset. If somebody becomes to... In our place, they say that if you want to do something not very nice with your father's other wife, you just go ahead and do that and don't say that she's the one that is seducing mm. you. If you don't want the youth to be included in power equation in Nigeria, it spreads that and not give excuse that they are not deeply experienced or enriched in knowledge. No. Our founding fathers and mothers were pretty young when they fought the British constitutionally, when they matched them logic for logic, ideas for ideas, when they wrote enchanting papers. On the models, they, they believe the, the post-colonial Nigerian state should adopt in terms of constitution building and nation state building. They were in their 30s and 40s. A few were even in their 20s. Now, when the military struck, one was 33 and held the nation together for nine years, even though a lot of people from the other side of the divide we, 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 we were not, you know, by that narrative. But at least he was a young person. And even when Abbasanjo came the first time, he was relatively young. They made mistakes, but they had some achievements recorded in their names. I was 32, 33. I'm saying this in public for the first time when I was a founding National Secretary of Alliance for Democracy. And that was a party of Dr. Tohangwo, of late Francis Ella, of late Abraham Adesanya, of late Bola Ige, of the Korea of Tiba, who is still very much around, of late Shuranko Nosonya, and many other. I was 32, 33, and they trusted that responsibility on me. I did not go knocking on every door to seek that position, but they said, here is a bright young man who we think is ideologically anchored and philosophically clear enough to lead a party that is of the left. Because Edi was the party mm -hmm. of his left center in that, in that formation. And we did relatively well. We made some mistakes. Therefore, if we have this new bill now that's likely going to be a law, not too young to run, and talk about the president being 40 or 35, National Assembly party, that is a correct age for people to learn in service, not learn outside. Learning service and they, and they get corrected when they make mistakes. Is there an ideological deficit in the politics? There is. That for me, we have to implicate the political parties in this haunting lack of an ideological direction of the Nigerian state. Every nation must be founded on core, not just on core values or ideas, but the codification of those values and ideas as a national philosophy. That's why I have the essence of American exceptionalism. A very troubling term. It reminds one almost of an exclusive 
essentialist mindset. We are a nation set apart. But then they say that because this is God's own country, land of opportunities, and Ameri of the American dream. So we are different in values from the rest of the world. And they try to walk through that idea, and it works. So when you have American exceptionalism as a philosophy, you must appreciate their place in historical you know, time in the world. So we must craft a Nigerian philosophy, founded around or enfolded around the core philosophies of the leading political parties. So you don't define a party in terms of normative terms alone. A party is supposed to organize people, galvanize them, run for election, build structures. How about the founding philosophy that you said that the People's Democratic Party, the you know, all progressive you know, uh, Congress, and the various other political parties are defined not just by administrative varieties, but by philosophical disputation. When there's ideological disputation at the political front, they need to key into the people because the party is supposed to mobilize the people. That even brings me to the current challenge facing the, Niger the Nigerian state. When the party in power and the, party in the parties in the position have huge responsibilities. It is not just to organize congr congresses and organize conventions periodically. It is to see political party activism as a living dynamic. In the US, parties campaign every day. They raise funds every day. But elected officials, party functionaries, they do constituency work. They hold town hall meetings. Because I suspect that if all the major parties in the country are to move back to the grassroots and begin mobilizing their people, to key into their own ideas about governance, idea, ideas about the nation state and its trajectory in development, we there will be less of these tensions, agitations, hate messages you find filling up the social the media space, especially the social media space. But the parties sometimes feel that election comes in a cycle. You do election, you win or you lose, then you go and husband your emotions, hibernate for four years, then you come back again. No, you do it every day. Trump, the other day was at a rally at West Virginia, before then at Iowa. But he's still in charge of Washington. He knows he has a button in his hands. His adversaries are after him. He needs to talk to his people. He needs to rev the engine of his base. Which parties are revving the engines of their base today? Because when you rev the engines of the party base, then you diminish and dilute the base of ethnic animals, the base of anger, of hate. That is what the patriotic movement of Nigeria set out to bring to the national discourse space. Some Nigerians have expressed concern. Will this entity called Nigeria scale through these, you know, numerous challenges, particularly with calls here for disintegration. People say, look, we want a state where, well, you've already put it and say these are uh, utopias. I, 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 necessarily... said, I said, we survive. You know why we survive? Because of the how. Right. The how is crucial. So let's most talk about the how. Yes, but we don't talk about the how. If you really deliberate about the how, what I call intersubjective rational deliberation, we are what we are doing. But then if you have like a town hall to discuss the idea of the nation state and its practical effect in society, how do we come out of where we are? How do we overcome the challenges of the moment? How do we transcend the odds of our time? When you settle down to debate the how, Nigeria will survive. But if you only deal with the what uh. and the when and the why, the nation state will be under tremendous stress. There's an interesting um, scenario which people always point to. All these uh, squabbles going on within. Step out of Nigeria and let three or four or five Nigerians from different ethnic groups ethnic and religious groups backgrounds and so on. Meet. Suddenly, their brothers and sisters, they love one another. The love is deep in our souls, the love is passionate for one another. But because we see the debilitating conditions of our times, and again, when I use terms like that, I measure them. Because our democratic process is an incremental one. Bill Clinton was here about 12, 13, 14 years ago, when he just left office and said, at the joint session of the National Assembly, you guys have impact on something very difficult, very torturous, very complicated. Therefore, it is not an event. And sometimes I always tell people that you cannot build a modest car with a modest engine and then give it a Ferrari body to win a, you know, a Formula One race. Our democratic journey and its projection in terms of constitution and practice is modest, 
but we expect a Ferrari kind of performance. So we need to be gradualist. And for somebody like me with a very radical background in terms of ideology to be gradualist in times I'm thinking, because I look at the society as a whole and see the deep challenges and I know that any radical eruption is going to further separate people from one another, deepen the fissures and the fault lines, and then compromise the nation state the way you and the manner you're talking about. But when we begin a gradualist process of changing the text of our constitution, through massive public buy-in and pressure on those who make the laws, when we now raise, rev the engine of citizenship participation in governance, and multiple voices weigh in on those who lead to hold them accountable, we will begin now to see that the territory of patriotism is not only at the frontiers of the, of the, of the ethnic nationalities, but within the domain of the center. But we begin to see that class affiliations, faith affiliations, generational affiliations, gender affiliations define a people, not just singularity of ethnic identity. What we know that the how is difficult to attain, but it must be attained in a very cool-headed, very mature way. Nigeria will survive. That is why we of this movement want to begin this public enlightenment and public education. It's for us to appreciate that there is a lot we can do, but a lot we can accomplish. It is said that um, education is key to most of what we've been talking about today. Absolutely. Right. And so we turn attention to that sector. Education. You left the academia. I did. In a way, I'm still, I'm still part of the academia because in the past for 12, 13 years, I've been doing my own self-education. That is very important in life. Whatever you do, always try to improve yourself. Every night, even when I was doing far more active politics, I don't go to bed until 4 a.m. I keep reading, researching, getting my old books and research papers out. And incredibly, there are about 18 of them. I'm waiting for the last three books to come together. That is because I never stopped reading and researching. Therefore, education is a lifelong venture. It's not something I've acquired good degrees. I've been here and I've been there, and then I seek to think. The only way we can inspire the younger generation is when they see the way and manner you respect and value and honor education. But most important, education, just like the globe, has undergone tremendous transformation. Right. So, so the old model or old mode of knowledge formation and knowledge production. It's no longer possible in the 21st century environment. Now, therein lies the, one of the biggest challenges of this country so far, transforming that sector to keep in... To, you know, with, with, with a technology-driven, you know, uh, almost deterritorized species in the 21st century in terms of even education and media. People use the tools of ICT, information technology, to survive. Those days of relying on public service jobs and clutching your CVs and going from office to office is gone. The jobs are not there and likely not ever coming back again, no matter how hard you try. Now, people must be self-reliant and be more creative and innovative. But to do so, the curricula has to change. The educational tools we have at the level of the secondary and post-secondary in, in those levels of education must be recalibrated and reattuned to the demands and the dictates and expectations of the 21st century. If you have the social media environment and internet spaces awash with all manners of buying and, buy and selling, people buy ideas and sell ideas. People buy information and sell information. That is why you find in the US a challenge to globalization. In Britain, a challenge to globalization. You know why? Because globalization with its technology, new mode of production, cut off a chunk of the population and set that population adrift from benefiting from the, from the, from the, from the commanding heights of globalization. So Trump, for example, was able to tap into those sanctuaries where people were cut off. So in Nigeria, almost everybody is cut off. Only few are hanging tough with a new value production model of the 21st century. So our education system has to be retooled and redesigned to accommodate the nuances of the moment, and equally with a view of interrogating, interpreting, and mastering the future time we have not even encountered. Let's go on the continental level now. Nigeria is, a, is key to Africa. Sure. And African countries, and you know, scholars watch and say, 
Nigeria pulling through will to a large extent define the kind of development we, we, we witness in Africa. Yes. That's precisely in the U.S. at a very narrow level. They say wherever Ohio goes, the nation goes. If whoever wins Ohio, most likely win the presidency. So wherever Nigeria goes, Africa goes. Up to a point, it makes sense. I think every one out of every five black person on earth is a Nigerian, the most populous black nation on, in the world. And most people expect that the performance of Nigeria at the economic realm at the level of politics and the level of governance will be the performance of Africa. I was in Durban in 2001 or two during the transition from the OAU to AU as a part of the presidential you know, delega delegation, Nigerian presidential delegation. An African leader spoke with passion, constructing the African century on that parameter set by three agendas. The new African Union, NEPAD, new partnership of African development and the peer review mechanism where the leaders hold themselves accountable. If African leaders led by Nigeria will drive these three processes, defining, redefining, and consolidating and deepening the trajectories of the African Union, but in terms of governance, in terms of conflict management, in terms of building the communities, what they call the regional communities, like ECOWAS and so on. If the African, the partnerships that define the part, both at the level of the nation state, at the continental level and globally, the partnership between African and multilateral institutions, the partnership between private organizations globally and African institutions, private partnership between the private sector and the public sector, etc. Nigeria is key to driving these processes. Then at the level of conflict resolution, we cannot, as Nigerians, resolve the conflict of others when we are racked by conflict. That's why it is important for us to put our hands in order, engage governance spaces, hold our leaders accountable across board, across all the parties, they begin to mainstream a new notion of patriotism. Patriotism that is transcendent in nature. Patriotism that overcomes the debilitating limitations of ethnicity and then faith. And a patriotism that is anchored on the deepest ideals of our founding fathers and mothers and the possibilities and potentiality that await the country in future. If we're able to master all that and do that, and get that done quickly too, we should be able to drag Africa on and then move the continent along the path in which you can safely say the 21st century was not only an American century, it too was an African century. Do you subscribe to a conspiracy theory that out there it's quite possible that there are advanced nations who would rather Nigeria and Africa didn't get to that level and therefore would do everything to fund the embers of this division that we it is not with. even a, it's not even a conspiracy theory it's, it's really unfortunately your assertion you know is born out by historical evidence and facts one i told a few friends of mine in nine, 2011 that the children of syria will suffer for the sins of the west in libya they didn't understand until how many years now? Five years. Because some people saw the destruction of the Libyan state and the removal of Gaddafi and his eventual killing as a conspiracy. It was an African model. It was a Middle East model. Why do you think there was, the West was in a hurry to topple secular autocracies? They were not democratic. They were autocracies, but they were secular. Ben Ali of Tunisia. Mubarak of Egypt, Saddam Hussein of Iraq, Gaddafi of Libya, secular autocracies that carry their nation together, stabilize the environment, and suddenly find the so-called Arab Spring of surge of hate, animals, angst, Inui, and the whole region has been convulsed by violence, dis dislocations of persons and services. And Syria today is almost a third state. Some people believe it's not just war against terror or war against, you know, rising tide of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, inconsideration among these leaders of these countries. But some desire to keep the place in perpetual ferment, in the state in which they will not be able to harness their hidden, 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 hidden gifts and abilities to become a counterweight to what the West has in, in store for mankind, which is their own enlightened self-interest. 
And again, there's nothing wrong about it. So nation states that are strong should not fall or succumb to such destabilization pyrotechnics, but must always build their strength from within because it is internal conditions of a nation that define the relationship of that nation with external forces. If a nation is strong, some people may not like Iran, they may like Iran. It's the strength of Iran that has kept the Iranian state intact with all the massive pressures from the West. It is the strength of Putin in Russia that revived a society that crumbled 25 years or so ago from the commanding height of the Soviet Union to its lowest depth. Now it is back again to the international scene. Resilient. When you're strong inside, few will oppose you from outside. But when we're weak, Nigeria and the rest of African countries that make up the continent of Africa, then those who drive the agenda of destabilization, of weakening us, just strategically weakening us in order to keep us in a state of permanent you know, obligation to them. And when we are completely racked by tension, conflict, and disaster, we again appeal to them to come and help us solve our problems. If we understand that, and then dig deep within our own internal you know, combustible engine and say, we can rev that engine of national growth and development. We can rev the engine of national patriotism. We can rev the engine of national assertion. And then work in partnership with the rest of the other countries in Africa. And again, in partnership with the rest of the world. You can no longer isolate. There are, there are complexes and discontents of globalization. And I subscribe to some discontents and, 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 and the, you know, discontents. But I'm a realist, which means until you deglobalize the world, until globalization dies a natural death as part of the moments in human trajectory and human development, we have to engage it and deal with it. Is that going to, is that going to ever happen? It's going it's to happen because I don't look at history as godless of time. I look at history as majestic sweep in millennia considerations. That at the time, Africa was a cradle of human civilization. That's not fallacy. That's not a fable. That the first original civilization was in Abyssinia. And that Egyptian civilization was already in decadence when Greece was emerging from East infanthood. That Rome was a barbaric state to Greece and Britain was a barbaric nation to Rome. That US was a colony of Britain and today the master of the globe. So a time will come when we are going to you know, overcome the scaffold of unbelief and faithlessness. When we reach across the eye across ethnic frontiers of the nation, across its intergenerational lines, its gender gaps, and bridge them to have a trajectory of it to the future of people proud of their inheritance and proud of their moment and proud of tomorrow. It is possible, this generation. It is possible. Right. Udenta or Udenta has been interesting talking to you on the state of the nation. Uh, we hope to ask you to come again but some other thank time. Thank you, sir. It's always a pleasure, too. It's yeah. been long when we had our last conversation. Right. And I'm so. sure I'm always available. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming. It's a pleasure. And uh, it is on that optimistic note we conclude this edition of this program, One and One. Next week, we'll be back with One and One. I am Cyril Stober. Bye for now. <laughs> Thank you.